Hey, YouTube. Hey, Brian. Hey. Good to be here with you, as always. Ready yeah. to do some podcasting? Definitely. Hey, Brandon. Happy to see you out there in the live stream, everyone in the live stream. If uh, you're here, please throw out comments, thoughts, questions. And if you're watching it afterwards, well, maybe the live stream's over, but thanks for thanks for being here anyway. Yeah, tough. Hello and welcome to Python Bytes, where we deliver Python news and headlines directly to your earbuds. This is episode 288, recorded June 14th, 2022. I'm Michael Kennedy. And I am Brian Aachen. Brian, how are you doing? I'm I hear you're busy. Today. Hmm? I hear you're a little busy. <laughs> but it's just, you know, being a parent and having side jobs and stuff like that. Of course. Well, it's better than the alternative, not being busy. Definitely. I was talking to somebody this weekend about like their one job and trying to balance job and life. And I'm like, I don't even remember what that's like with just one job in life. I know. Or you have a job where you go to work and you do the work. And then when you go home, you there's no real reason, no, no real way to yeah. do, do the job anymore. So you can just step away from it. It sounds glorious. Uh, and yet I continue to choose the opposite, which I also love. All right. Well, Speaking of stuff people might love, you want to kick us off with your first item? Yeah, we're going to talk about polar bears. No, uh, not polar bears. A project called Polars. And actually, it's it's like super fun and cool. So Polars was suggested to us by actually several listeners. We got several people uh, sent in. And I'm sorry I don't have their names, but thank you. Always send, send great stuff our way. We love it. Um, but uh, Polars is billed as a lightning fast data frame library for Rust and Python. And it is it is written in Python. Um, no, it's written in Rust. And <laughs> but they have um, they have like a, they've have a full uh, the full API is uh, is present in Python. And it's just it's kind of neat, actually, how they've done it. But so we've got up on the screen, the splash screen for for, uh, for the Polars project. Um, there's a user guide and API reference, of course, but one of the things I wanted to talk about is there some of their, their uh, why you would consider it. So Polars is lightning fast data frame library. It uses an in-memory query engine and it's in the, it says it's embarrassingly parallel in execution and it has a cache, cache efficient algorithms and expressive API and they say it makes it perfect for efficient data wrangling, data pipelines, snappy APIs, and so much more. But um, I just it also is fun. It, it, it's uh, I played with it a little bit. It's zippy and fun. They have both um, the ability to do uh, e lazy execution and eager execution, whichever you prefer for your use. Um, it's multi-threaded. Uh, has a has a notion of a uh, single single instruction, multiple data. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but makes it faster apparently. Uh, and um, the uh, I was looking through the the uh, the whole the introduction. The user's guide is uh, is actually written like a very well written book, and it looks like the whole guide, as far as I can tell, is is written for the pan or for the Python API. So I think that was part of the intent all along is to write it quickly in Rust. Expose it to Rust users also, but also um, uh, run it with Python. And um, it's just really pretty clean and super fast. One of these uh, benchmark results performance things was um, it's like uh, Spark was taken 332 seconds and they took 43 wow. seconds. So um, I, I know it's 100 million rows. <laughs> yeah. Seven columns. That's not a just like let's look load up a couple of pieces of data or something right so the um there's a lot of focus on this making it making sure that it's fast especially when you don't need everything like uh doing lazy evaluation or um making sure you do multi-processing one of the things i thought was really kind of cool about it i was looking through the documentation is there's a section on um uh, that says uh it was is, is this section that that was talking about parallelization it says do not kill the parallelization because with python we know we we there is basically there's ways to use polars that can kill uh, uh parallel processing because of the gill if you're if you're using um if you don't do it the way they've set it up uh 
you can use it in a way that makes it a little slower, I guess, is what I'm saying. But yeah. so there's a section on this talking about the uh, uh, polar expressions, polars expressions. And these are all set up so that you can pass these uh, expressive queries into polars and have it run in the background and um, just make things really fast with it and sort of skirt around the the uh, gill because you're doing all the work in the rust part of part of the world and uh, and then collecting the, the the data later so there's like a set up the query and then collect the query um that's kind of cool so anyway i just thought this is a really looks fun it's um it's just a there's nothing to you don't have to do know that it's in rust you just say pip install polars and it works so yeah that's great out in the audience uh Sarab asks, why Rust and not C? I mean, maybe an example there is pandas versus this. Also, probably the person who wrote it just really likes Rust. And I think Rust has a little bit more thread safety than straight C does. I'm not 100% sure. But this uses threads, as you point out, whereas the other one, pandas and others in C don't. I, I also think that we're going to see a lot more of things like this. Like, um, because... Yeah. I think some of the early um, faster packages for Python were written in C because Rust wasn't around or it wasn't mature enough. But I think we're going to see more people saying, "Well, I want it. I want it to be closer to the the processor for some of the stuff. Um, why not Rust? Because I think I think Rust is a cleaner development environment than C right now. So yeah, I agree. Absolutely, it's just a more modern language, right? <sighs> I you know C's keeping up C isn't 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 is never going to be old I don't think but yeah. yeah 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 I don't mean to say that C is out not modern in the sense that people are not using it but it doesn't embrace in its sort of natural form the most you know smart pointers and things like that right yeah C, there's C++ and there's plus maybe but not C there's safety features written built into Rust to make sure you don't that just make it easier to not do dumb things. Uh, I guess. Yes. So, no. <laughs> Indeed. All right. Well, let's jump on to my first item, which is a follow-up from last week. Python Developer Survey 2021. Yes, you heard that right. I know it's 2022. These are the results from the survey that was at the end of last year. So let's... I'm going to kind of skim through this and just hit on some of the, the main ideas here. There's a ton of information, and I encourage people to go over and scroll through it. This is done in conjunction with the folks over at JetBrains, the PyCharm team and all that. So it was collected and analyzed by the JetBrains folks, but put together independently by the PSF, right? So it's, it's not, it's intended to not be skewed in any way towards them. All right, so first thing is, if you're using Python, is it your main language or your secondary language? 84% of the people say it's their main language with 16% taking up the balance of not so much. It's been pretty stable over the last four years. What do you think of this, Brian? <laughs> it's been, I, I, I think that there's a lot of people like me, I think that it, it started out as my secondary language and now it's my main language. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Kind of got sucked in. Like, ah, maybe I'll use it to test my C stuff. Wait, actually, this is kind of nice. Maybe I'll do more of this. <laughs> yeah. There's always the, uh, the next question or analysis is always fraught uh, with weird overlaps. But I like the way they ask this a little bit better than a lot of times. It says Python usage with other languages. What other languages do you use Python with? Rather than maybe a more general one where they ask, well, what is the most popular language? And you'll see weird stuff like, well, most people code in CSS. Like, <laughs> I'm a full stack CSS developer. Like, no, you're not. Just everyone has to use it. Like, what is this? This is a horrible question. Yeah. Right. So this is like, if you're doing Python, what other languages do you bring into the mix? And I guess maybe just hit the top five JavaScript because you might be doing front end back end, HTML, CSS, same reason, bash shell because you're doing automation builds, so on, SQL because SQL. I'm surprised there's that much direct SQL, but there it is. And then C and C++, yeah. speaking of that language. Yeah. Also to uh, sort of address the thing that I brought up before, uh, Rust is at 6%. Last year it was at 5%. So it's compared to C at 30 and 29. So they both grew by 1% this year. Okay. Yeah. I, th I think it, they both grew. That's interesting. So. Yeah, exactly. Uh, another thing that people might uh, 
one to pay attention to is you'll see year over year stuff all over the place in these reports because they've been doing this for a while. So like the top bar that's darker or, or sorry, brighter is this year, but they always also put last year. So for example, people are doing less bash because you can see like it's, it's lower bar, it's higher and they're doing less PHP, which probably means they love themselves a little bit more. <laughs> don't, don't go home crying. Okay. Uh, let's see. Languages for web and data science. This is kind of like if you're doing these things, what to use more. So if you're doing data science, you do more. SQL is your most common thing. Um, if you're doing web, surprise, JavaScript and HTML is the most common other thing. Yeah. Let's see. What do you use Python for? Work and personal, 50%. Personal is 29 and work 20 percent it's kind of interesting that more people use it for side projects if they use it for just one or the other of work or personal i guess people who who know python at work they want to go home they're like you know what i could automate my house with this too let's do that i i think that yeah i, I would take it like that i think more people it isn't just even automating your house it's just playing around with it at home like yeah, I heard about this this new web framework, Fast API. I want to try it out. Uh, things like that. So yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna skip down here through a bunch of stuff. Uh, what do you use Python for the most? Web development, but that fell year over year. Data analysis stayed the same year over year. Machine learning fell year over year, <laughs> and a bunch of stuff. But so uh, sort of the growth areas year over year: are education and desktop development, and then uh, other. Which I think is pretty. Also, game development, like doubled, <laughs> doubled from one. To I two mean, percent. from one to two is probably like uh, there was, you know, that might be within the margin of error type of thing, but still, it doubled. Yeah. Uh, but I think just the other, uh, no, other didn't grow. There's just I think it's just more spread out. I don't know, because there's still I think same number of people using Python. All right, uh, yeah. are you a data scientist? One third yes, two thirds no. <laughs> That's, that fits with my um, mental model of the Python space. One-third data science, one-third web and API, and one-third massively diverse other. <laughs> so the way I see the ecosystem. Uh, Python 3 versus 2, I think we're asymptotically as a limit approaching <laughs> Python 3 only, but uh, year over year it goes 25% from 2017, then 16%. To Python two, then ten percent, then six, then five, and then there's just there's just huge code bases that are stuck on Python two. Like some of the big banks have like five thousand Python developers working on Python two code bases that are so specialized and tweaked that they can't just swap out stuff. So you know that might represent five percent bank usage. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's I just I feel bad for you. We're we're rooting for you. Everybody Come out on. there using Python two. <laughs> Let's Stick approach that limit. Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. let's divide by n factorial, not n for your limit there. Let's go. Get in there. All right. Um, Python 3.9 is the most common version. Uh, 3.10 being 16% and 3.8 being 27% versus 35. So that's that's pretty interesting. Um, yeah. I feel like this is, hey, this is what comes with my Linux. And this is what comes with my Docker. So I'm using that. But maybe it's more... Um, Explicit. Yeah, it's interesting because because you and I like are, are an interesting space because we're always looking at the new stuff. So I yes. I'm at I'm at three ten and I can't wait to jump to three eleven. Um, yeah. And actually, I switched to three eleven for some projects. Uh, so, uh, but there's a lot of people that's like, man, Python's pretty good and it's been good for a while. So I don't need a lot of the new features. Uh, so yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm I'm going to uh, later talk about something that might shift that. Yeah. to the right <laughs> i've actually been thinking like should i maybe install 311 beta and see how stable that is on the servers <laughs> we'll, we'll see that might be a bad choice but it might be a good choice and so we'll see okay uh where do you install python from 38 percent. just download the thing from python.org and run with that yeah the next most common option is uh to install it via your os package manager apt homebrew whatever and yeah. alvaro has a great little recommendation out there for people who are stuck on python 2 so there probably is a support group for python 2 users hi my name is brian and i use <laughs> python 2 <laughs> hi brian <laughs> all right uh another one i thought was pretty interesting is um 
the packaging stuff, the isolation stuff. Um, before we get there, really quick, Web Frameworks Fast API continues to grow. Yeah, pretty strong here. We've got Flask is now maybe within the margin error, but just edged ahead of Django. But Fast API almost doubled in usage over the last year. It grew nine percentage points, but it was at twelve percent last year, and so now it's at twenty-one percent, which is that's a pretty big chunk to take out of established frameworks. Yeah. Well, and it looks like the third is none. I haven't tried that yet. Uh, yeah, it gets a lot of attribute errors, but it's it's really efficient because it doesn't do much work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, people uh, who maybe don't know, Fast API, the name would indicate it's only for building APIs, but you can build web apps with it as well, and it's pretty good at that. Um, so, I mean, basically, if like you check back. out Michael. Yeah, especially if you check out Michael's courses. He's got like two courses on building web apps. With, uh, Thanks. Fast. I I do, and I also have uh, some some sort of template extensions for it to make it easier. All right, data science libraries. Um, I don't know how I feel about this one. Do you use NumPy? Well, yes, but if you yeah. use other libraries, then you also use NumPy. So, yeah, it's like all of these are using NumPy. So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. A uh, bunch of other stuff. Look at that for unit testing. Would it surprise you that PyTest is winning? No, it they, just they, overtook none this year, didn't it? Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, all right. Uh, ORMs, SQL Alchemy is ahead, and then there's uh, Django ORM. I mean, Django is tied to Django. SQL Alchemy is broad, so there's there's that, and then kind of the none of the ORM world is raw SQL at 16%. That's pretty interesting. Postgres is the most common database by far at 43%. Then you have SQLite, which is a little bit of a side case. You can use it directly, but it's also used for development. And then MySQL, the MongoDB, and then Redis, and then Microsoft SQL Server. So, Yeah. Huh. Actually, SQL uh, Server and Oracle are higher than I would have expected, even though, you know, but it's okay. Well, I think what you're going to find is that there's like certain... Places, especially in the in enterprise, where it's like we're a SQL Server shop or we're an Oracle shop, and our DBAs manage our databases. So here, you you put in a, you file a ticket, and they'll create a database for you. That kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, or you know there's I mean? a there's already an existing database, and you're connecting yep. to it or something. Yep, yeah, yep, exactly, exactly. All right, let's keep going. Cloud platforms, AWS is at the top, then you got Google Cloud uh, at 50%, and then GCP, Google Cloud Platform, then Azure, then Heroku, DigitalOcean. Linode has made it on the list here, so, uh, you know, uh, nice. former or sometime sponsor of the show. Uh, it's good for them. And let's see, do you run, how do you run stuff in the cloud? Let's skip over this. I think a bunch of interesting, a few more interesting things, and we'll, we'll call it. Compared to 2020, Linux and Mac OS popularity decreased by 5%, while Windows usage has risen by 10%. Wow. Yeah, we're the Windows people now double, more than double the Mac OS people and are almost rivaling the Linux people. That's, um, I think that's just uh, towards the growth of Python. Uh, I think um, Python's just yeah. making it more into everybody's using it sort of thing. Yeah, and there's also a uh, Windows subsystem for Linux. It's been coming along pretty yeah. strong, which makes Windows yeah. more viable, uh, more on, have, have more parity with your cloud targets, right? Yeah. And if you like out in the audience, it's because of WSL, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see, a few more things. Documentation, it's cool they're asking about like what documentation frameworks you use. This one's interesting to me. What's your main editor, VS Code or PyCharm? I ask this question a lot at the end of Talk Python, and it feels like VS Code, VS Code, VS Code, VS Code is what people are saying all the time. But it's thirty-five percent VS Code, thirty-one percent PyCharm. And Brian, right there for you, seven percent Vim. But <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> I just teased you. <laughs> yeah. To be fair, it's both VS Code. It's v it's all three or yeah. top top four for me. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, often you probably just use Vim bindings within the other two, right? Yep. Uh, let's see. I think also maybe another interesting breakdown is that if you look at the usage scenarios or the, the type of development done with the editors, you get different answers. So like for uh, data science, you've got 
more PyCharm and for web development. Wait, I think, hold on, drive that right? No, oh, for, for data science, you have a lot more VS Code. For web development, you have more PyCharm. And you have a lot less other in data science, AKA Jupyter. <laughs> I was just oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. How did you learn about your editor? By far, or first one here is from a friend. So basically, friends like push editors, like drug dealers, like you gotta get out. What are you doing on that thing? Get in here and no, I just get in. No, I think it's like it, it, if I'm if I'm <laughs> watching somebody do something cool, I want to do it also. Because yeah, exactly. You sit down helpful. next to your friend. And you're like, how did you do that? That's awesome. I want that feature. Right? I think yeah. you're probably right. Okay, let's just bust down a few things better. Um, one, do you know, or what do you think about the new developer in residence role? This is Lucas Shalinga that's going on right now. 77% are like, the what? <laughs> Never heard of it. <laughs> so uh, maybe like we got we got a little more advocates, advocacy job to do here, but he's been doing a great job really speeding things up and sort of greasing the wheels of open source contributions and whatnot. I, 14%. Yeah, but yeah. I'm going to take it like design because if design's done well, nobody knows it's there. And yeah. I think the same thing. I think if he's doing his job really, really well, most people won't notice. Things will just work better. So. Yep. <laughs> uh, quick real time follow up. Felix out in the audience says, I use PyCharm because of Michael. Ah, that's nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think it should have been one of the options in the survey because of Michael. <laughs> oh, come on. That's awesome. <laughs> But no, uh, let's see. There's a bunch of questions about that. And the final thing I want to touch on is Python packaging. Uh, let's see here. Which tools related to Python packaging do you use directly? And we've talked about poetry. We've talked about uh, Flit, um, PIP, ENV, and so on. And 81% of the people are like, I use PIP for packaging. <laughs> and uh, compare <laughs> as opposed to Flit or something. And then compare uh, sort of parallel to that is for virtual environment. Uh, do you use the, you know, what do you use for virtual environments basically? Like 42% yeah. is like, I just use the built in one or I use the virtual ENV wrapper. And then it's like poetry, PIP ENV, uh, talks, and so on. There's a few I don't know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm. I'm glad they included that because the, the one of the original questions didn't include like the built-in V and V and yeah. that's, I think that's what most people use. So it is. And yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I think there's, there's more in my progress bar here. This is a super detailed report. Um, link into it in the show notes. So just go over there and check it out. If you want to see all the cool graphs and play with the interactive aspects, but thanks again to the PSF and JetBrains for putting this together. It's really good to have this insight uh, and these, these, projections of where things are going yeah all right hey i'm gonna grab the next one uh oh, we did this smoothly this time uh nice so um gin config is is a is is just gin actually but the the project's called gin config um and it's it's kind of a neat little thing it's a different way to think about configuration files so um like you have you have your Py project, or you have .toml files. You could have .any files. There's a lot of ways to have configuration files, but um, but Jin takes the the perspective of, oh uh, well, what what if you just um, what if you're not really into all of that stuff, and you're a machine learning person, and you just have a whole bunch of stuff to configure, and you're changing stuff a lot? Uh, maybe let's make it easier. So I actually came across this because of. Um, because of Vincent, uh, Vincent, Warm, Warm, Vincent Warmerdam, he's got an excellent intro to Jin uh, on his uh, Com Code site, and the idea is you've got these. You just have for a, for a function that you want to um, in your code. You got some code, and you have like part of it that you want configurable. You just slap a Jin configurable uh, decorator onto it. And then all of the parameters to that function are now something that can show up in a config file. And it's not in any file. I don't, actually don't know the exact syntax, but it just kind of looks like Python. It's a, you just have a, 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 a names. Uh, like in, the, in this example that I'm showing, there's a, there's a file called simulate. And there's a, actually a function called simulate and a parameter called in samples. And in your config file, you can just say, 
simulate dot in samples equals a hundred or something like that. Oh wow! Um, this is like it basically sets the default parameters for all your functions you're calling. Yeah, the ones that you want to be configurable, and you could just do that. Um, now it's still work. You can still set defaults within your code, and um, and just like you normally would, and then and then you can configure the ones that you want to be different than the defaults. So that's a that's a possibility. And there's a whole bunch of. Uh, I'm going to expand this a little bit. There's a whole bunch of different um, uh, things that um, Vincent goes through, like required settings. You can have uh, you can specify like a dot. Oh, what is it? Um, gin dot required as a function, and it makes it so that or as your parameter, and then it makes mm -hmm. it so that your user has to put it in their config file. Um, that's kind of cool. And then you can also, <laughs> if you don't want somebody to configure something. You can uh, you can mark it as um, oh he's got blacklist the uh, the in samples so if you want like in this example he's got a simulate function with two parameters random func and in samples you want people to configure the random func but you don't want them to touch the in samples uh, you can you can say don't do that so um, yeah it's kind of neat there's cool. a whole bunch of cool features around it like uh, uh, like being able to specify different functions so you can name things and. Uh, do it around like uh, like to say like in his, his example he's got random functions and if you you can specify you know one of the other one of the other uh, like a random triangle function you can specify a function and assign it to that he's got uh, named things um, it's a really it it's a interesting way to think about configuration and the uh, the the motivation section of the documentation for Jin says um, that often modern machine learning experiments require just configuring a whole bunch of parameters and uh, to, and then you're tweaking them and stuff and and uh, and to have that be as easy as possible and as simple as possible um, because it is and you're gonna add some and take some away and things like that because some things you want configured and then you decide not to not having to go through a config parser system, uh, and just making it as trivial as possible to add parameters, I think it's a really cool idea. So, it is a cool idea. It reminds me of like dependency injection a little bit. Yeah, uh, you know where you would like configure, uh, say like if somebody asks for a function that implements this or that that goes here, like this is the data access layer to use, or here's the ORM I want you to pick this time. It's not super common in Python, but it, it's pretty common in a lot of languages. And it feels a little bit like that. Like, can we configure stuff so it, we have these parameters that we might use for testing or something, but it just, they get filled in automatically, right? Even Fast yeah. API has that, for example. Yeah. Um, pretty cool. Somebody in the audience says it isn't, uh, uh, isn't Jin used with Go? Um, and I'm not sure about that, but it, uh, Jin is, is not an officially supported Google product, but it's under the Google like uh, GitHub repo group. So maybe, yeah, Don't maybe know. it does look very Python like though for the config files and that's cool. Yeah. Oh, good one. All right. Uh, let me switch back before I swap over. Okay, here we go. Now this next one, I think universally will be well accepted. Although the comment section about it was a little bit rough and tumble. Nonetheless, I think it should be universally exciting to everyone. And this comes to us from Eduardo Orochena, who sent over this article that said, the what's it called? The Python 311 performance benchmarks are looking fantastic. And oh boy, are they. So we're talking beta code six months out. Right. And still, still, we've got some pretty neat stuff. So this this links over to an article with that same title uh, by Michael Larabelle. Basically says, look, we took a whole bunch of different performance benchmarks for Python and ran them on Python 3.11 beta, which this is the thing I was hinting at. Like, you might really want to consider this for if you're thinking, should we upgrade from 9 to 10? Maybe you want to just go straight to 11. Right. I mean, and, you know, it's sort of a side thought, Brian. Isn't it awesome that the one that goes like crazy performance, this one goes to 11? 
<laughs> all right so they show um uh, all the stuff that they're testing on like an amd ryzen 16 core 32 with hyper threading the motherboard i mean like down to the motherboard and the chipset and the memory and all that so a pretty decent stuff and then also the like the build commands and all sorts of things here so pretty repeatable i think Rather than just like, hey, I ran it, and here's a graph without, um, without axes, <laughs> you know, or something like that. So you can kind of click through here, and you see some pictures, and it says, all right, well, there's the Pi Bench, which I think is like the standard, simple one. It says, look at this, the Python three eleven beta is faster than three ten, which, by the way, was slightly slower than the previous ones. But you know, what is that, ten percent or something? So already actually 16% better. So that's already pretty awesome. But there's a whole bunch of other ones. They did one called Go. I don't know what these benchmarks are. This does, I don't think this has anything to do with the language Go. It's just the name of the benchmark. And then there's two to three and chaos. That one sounds like the funnest. But if you look at this Go one, this one is like almost 50% faster. 50% faster. That's insane, right? Yeah. Wow. And you come down to the two to three is, uh, these are all estimates, 25, 20% faster, say 40% faster with the chaos one. Come down to the float operations and Python 3.10 was already better than the others. But this is again, maybe 30% faster. And let's keep rolling to the next page. You just kind of see this across the board better, better. Some of them are super better. Some are like a little bit better, like path labs better, but not crazy. Ray tracing is like, again, 40% better here. And you keep going. There's another one with this huge crypto pie AES, some sort of encryption thing. So there's just a bunch of a couple of these are there's like this one at the end. You're like, Oh, wait, this one got way worse. Be careful because it says more is better on this. Uh, composition i guess is the results here like how much more computing power do you get per cpu cycle or whatever hmm. what is that that's a massive jump you saw a little bit better improvements from three eight to three nine three nine to three ten but three ten to eleven is like a forty percent yeah forty one percent better on the beta before it's even final wow that's pretty exciting right that's very exciting um yeah. and actually i think I'm curious what some of these uh, negative comments are, but the interesting thing is they run lots of different metrics and are lots of nif lots of different benchmarks, and having them all be it's faster kind of means that I mean I I take it as uh, you know your mileage may vary, but it's going to be better um, for whatever you're doing probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This it feels like this is a thing you could just install and things get better. Uh, the negative comments are mostly like, well, if Python was so slow, it could be made this faster than Python's a crappy language. It's pretty much, I've summed up like 65 comments right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. By the way, so, uh, so I, I interviewed um, um, Guido Van Rossum and Mark Shannon uh, a little while ago about this whole project about making Python five times, not 40%, but five times faster. And the goal is to make it a little bit faster like this, each release for five releases in a row. And because of compounding, that'll get you to like 5%. So it looks like they're delivering, which is awesome. Yeah, this is good. Yeah. Cool. Cool, cool. All right. Um, yeah, I think that's it for all of our items. Got yeah. any extras? Um, no, I was going to pull up the... Uh, the so you had the... the this one goes to 11 if people don't know that that's a spinal tap <laughs> reference so, um, oh, this is... <laughs> yeah exactly all right i got a few extras to throw out real quick python 3.10.5 is out with a bunch of bug fixes like what happens if you create an f string that doesn't have a closing curly and just a bunch of crashes and bug fixes so if you've been running into issues you know maybe there's a decent amount of stuff in the change log here nice people can check that out also real quick People might, if they're on a Mac, they might check out Raycast, which is a replacement for the command space spotlight thing that has like all these developer plugins. So you can do like interact with your GitHub <laughs> repo through command space and stuff. 
you can create little uh, macros and there's a bunch of extensions uh, like uh, this thing's free at least for not for team if you're not on a team but there's a bunch of different uh, things you can get that are cool like managing processes doing searches vs code project management from command space and whatnot the one that i set up is i can now do command space and then just type pypi and then it'll just search pypi for whatever i type like here's an example of typing pypi then fast api and it'll like pull up all the fast api packages so anyway people might find that fun to check out yeah that's uh, cool yeah it's pretty neat all right. Well, um, I think I'll, I'll not talk about my other one. And then joke. Shall we close it out with a joke? Yeah, let's do a joke. So I think this ties really well back to the PSF survey. We talked about, well, what framework do you use? What data science framework do you use? Or, or what web framework do you want to use? Django or Flask or Fast API or what? So here's one that is a, a pretty interesting analysis. And the title is, why wouldn't you choose Parrot for your next application? Not a framework, but literally a parrot. <laughs> and this is this is compared to machine learning. So it has like this, this breakdown of features, like a featured um, table. And it has a parrot, which literally just has a picture of a parrot. And this is machine learning algorithms with a neural network. And then it lists off the features. Learns random phrases. Check, check. <laughs> Doesn't understand anything about what it learns. Check, check. <laughs> Occasionally speaks nonsense. Check, check. It's a cute birdie parrot. Check, fail. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why wouldn't you choose this, Brian? <laughs> uh, this is funny. I, I love it. Um, yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty good stuff. It actually reminds me of like, I have to pull up this article. So I was reading about uh, some machine learning stuff to, to, to try to get models like even closer and closer to reality. There's a whole bunch of tricks people do. And then, and then there's some analysis of like, sometimes it's actually not doing anything more than just a linear regression. So, um, <laughs> yeah, try or simple first. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> so they're using artificial intelligence to make the computer decide. No, it's an if statement. Like it's just computers <laughs> deciding things the old fashioned way. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So. All right. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks everyone Thank for you. listening.